welcome to you madam and uh, we really feel privileged to uh, have a class uh, by an expert on thyroid cancers looking forward to learn more from you over to you madam yeah uh, thank you for the very nice introduction uh, i've seen the pleasant face of you almost every day in our surgery ot but uh, this is a different aspect of yours that i'm seeing today uh, you're doing a great job by probably disseminating a lot of knowledge to a lot of people uh, which is the need of the hour today so uh, without much further ado um, like you said uh, the topic of thyroid is quite relevant in most of the specialties um uh, today i'm talking about surgical relevance of carcinoma thyroid but uh, definitely it is more relevant in obstetrics and pediatrics as well uh, pediatric thyroid carcinomas are extremely uh, aggressive uh, the extremes of age what we say is pediatric and very old age uh, they are extremely aggressive and they need to be treated aggressively as well so uh, the the kind of clearance that we give has to be near complete um otherwise they come back with recurrence and they come back with uh, what we say is recurrence with vengeance they come back really bad so and how is it relevant in obstetrics most of the malignancies behave very differently in an uh, in a pregnant patient so there are a lot of hormonal variations happening so in that case um, a, a pregnant lady who is suffering from any malignancy generally tends to behave very differently and uh, the treatment also becomes very different because uh, most of these affect uh, most of the treatments that we offer in malignancies are uh, are those that affect growing cells so the growing cells as we know are more relevant in a pregnant patient so uh, those particular uh, forms of treatment like chemotherapy or radioactive iodine or radiation needs to be avoided during that period so most of our treatment is centered around personalizing treatment in these patients particularly uh, during their third trimester in and around their postpartum period etc so they uh, tend to behave differently and they tend to be treated differently as well so um, without wasting much of our time we'll start with the carcinoma thyroid so like we know uh, carcinoma of the thyroid gland is an uncommon cancer not so common but is the most common malignancy amongst all the endocrine glands it accounts for 90% of endocrine cancers it constitutes to less than 1% of all human malignant tumors that is why i say it's an uncommon cancer so uh, how do we pathologically classify this uh, kind of tumor we generally have a pathological classification system for all malignancies which is described as the who classification system so uh, for most malignancies we have the addition of who classification that comes out almost every year so uh, in thyroid we differentiated broadly as differentiated moderately differentiated undifferentiated or poorly differentiated and others so under differentiated two main subtypes come uh, into picture so that is papillary thyroid carcinoma and follicular thyroid carcinoma most often when we speak of thyroid malignancies the the 90% occurrence amongst the endocrine system that i mentioned is accountable for differentiated thyroid cancers moderately differentiated i'll come to it later so out of uh, the two papillary thyroid cancer becomes more common than the follicular thyroid uh, cancer so under papillary thyroid we have a lot of variants few of the variants are these pure papillary mixed papillary papillary microcarcinoma diffuse sclerosing variants tall cell variants etc i'll talk about the variants later follicular carcinoma again has pure follicular clear cell carcinoma herthel cell carcinoma so there um, the angio invasion that we mention as uh, one of the features that differentiates a follicular adenoma from carcinoma that invasion is also categorized into minimally angio in invasive widely angio invasive depending on the risk factors that are uh, particular factors that are present on the pathological slide of a follicular thyroid cancer so then comes the moderately differentiated so under moderately differentiated is the medullary thyroid cancer which is mostly familial this behaves very very differently from the other forms of thyroid cancer medullary thyroid cancer is dealt differently undifferentiated or poorly uh, differentiated thyroid cancers mostly include anaplastic thyroid cancers and other malignant tumors like lymphoma sarcoma fibrosarcoma metastatic tumors from elsewhere all these are generalized tumors that can occur in the thyroid these are also classified under thyroid carcinomas so uh, any patient who comes with a solitary thyroid nodule uh, should be investigated in the lines of uh, ruling out carcinoma uh, solitary thyroid cancers can account uh, for up to 30 to 33 percentage of malignancies in thyroid 
So uh, an FNAC is uh, most often enough to identify uh, malignancy if at all it is performed in a guided procedure. So uh, an ultrasound guided FNAC is what we recommend. So in that, um, the chances of finding the um, th uh, differentiated form of thyroid cancers in a solitary thyroid nodule significantly comes down. So when a person walks into your OPD with a solitary thyroid nodule, the chance of picking up cancer in that man or woman will be up to 30%. So uh, the goal of our investigations are is to identify those patients who have particularly high risk for malignancy in these cases of solitary thyroid nodules and how to effectively manage these patients with these lesions. So uh, the most common presentation, like I said, in a thyroid malignancy is a solitary thyroid nodule. A multinodular goiter, on the other hand, is usually benign. Very, very rarely you have a tiny focus of malignancy in it. Uh, the other features which indicate malignancy in, in a case of thyroid uh, mass is fixation of mass to the trachea, unusual firmness on examination, recent growth, recent rapid growth uh, in the neck, symptoms of dysphagia, hoarseness, or presence of enlarged lymph nodes, dysphagia, hoarseness, indicating local invasion, and presence of enlarged lymph nodes clearly suggests the possibility of malignancy in these patients. So cancer is more likely, especially if the gender is male, if there is a previous history of radiation exposure, this is uh, this becomes classically important in, in the cases of people who are exposed to the Chernobyl disaster, etc. in the past. Or history of other radiation to the neck, for example, uh, in the past for acne, for adenoids, uh, radiation used to be given. So history of prior radiation exposure, age more than 60 years, extremes of age, like I said, any uh, thyroid nodule in extremes of age becomes significant. And uh, a cold nodule, uh, th this is uh, far less uh, common um, these days because we don't do a radioactive iodine scan that often. But if you pick up a cold nodule in a radioactive iodine scan, that again points towards cancer. And in a patient with a long-standing history of hypothyroidism. So hypothyroids have a tendency to have a focus of malignancy much more than a case of hyperthyroidism. Uh, in a case of Graves' disease or a secondary thyrotoxicosis, finding malignancy is extremely rare. Uh, also, those cases with family history of multiple endocrine neoplasias also have uh, a tendency of having familial uh, papillary thyroid carcinomas, FPTCs is what we call them. So uh, cancer is more likely when you see these characteristics on, in those patients. So uh, I don't think you can see the first line here. Uh, the first line says TFT. Uh, person walks in, first you do non-invasive tests first, followed by invasive tests. So non-invasive test, the first one becomes the blood test. You rule out functional abnormality in the thyroid by doing a thyroid function test. Usually done in the fasting, uh, as a um, fasting um, uh, blood test at 8 a.m. in the morning. Most of the hormone tests that we do is done at 8 a.m. in the morning because of the waxing and waning of the hormones that happen uh, naturally, physiologically in the body. So uh, once we diagnose uh, that the functional, uh, functionally the thyroid is normal, then we go ahead and do an ultrasound of the neck. A basic ultrasound of the neck will show different characteristics of the thyroid. Generally, it is graded in the form of tyrides. Like we say birides in the breast, it's called tyrides in the thyroid. So there are certain features that we look for. Uh, whether the nodule is solid or cystic, solid pointing towards more towards malignancy. Uh, the ultrasound can help us in guiding our FNAC where to place the needle exactly to find out the focus of malignancy. And evaluation of recurrent thyroid cancer in the thyroid bed in, in the case of um, regional lymph nodes that are palpable. So the lymph node characteristics also point towards uh, the lymph nodes being malignant or metastatic from the uh, uh, primary thyroid cancer. So the features suggestive of malignancy in the thyroid will be hypoechoic nodules. The echogenicity is what we look for. Echogenicity is in whether it is bright or dark in comparison to the nearby muscle. So the muscle is usually sternocleidomastoid. Uh, so whether it is hypoechoic, if it becomes more and more hypoechoic, it points towards malignancy. Presence of microcalcifications. Uh, thick, irregular or absent ha halo. Uh, halo is classically seen in benign lesions. Whereas absent halo, irregular margins become a point more towards malignancy, irregular margins, like I said. And regional lymph nodes, presence of regional lymph nodes, again, point towards uh, an underlying malignancy of the thyroid. 
intranodular flow so if there the vascularity is localized and increased inside the thyroid nodule again it points towards malignancy so this is the acr tyroids that we follow american college of radiology this is a standard form of reporting for any ultrasound neck when you look for um, uh, a thyroid pathology in the ultrasound neck this is what you need to look for uh, uh, um, a radiologist who is trained in thyroid ultrasound will always give you a tyroids grading. So, uh, so tyroids three and above is what we are looking at. Tyroids one and two are completely benign and need only follow up. So, uh, what we need to understand is any thyroid nodule that comes to your OPD or any thyroid nodule that is picked up accidentally by ultrasound neck need not be operated. Uh, just because it is more than one centimeter in uh, size, it need not be operated. Most of these thyroid nodules can be on follow up. Like we say, thyroid malignancies behave very, very differently as uh, opposed to other malignancies in the body. Uh, they, are, uh, they are generally dealt with like a disease rather than malignancy. So uh, most of these patients die of other diseases rather than thyroid malignancies. So the, the malignancy per se is very, very slowly progressive. Hence, we have a very minimally invasive approach for uh, dealing with thyroid cancers these days. So the tyroids 3, 4, and 5 are what we are looking at. These are the patients who need to be on constant follow-up. These are the patients who need additional investigations. So like I said, there are five components that they look at when they uh, grade the th uh, thyroid nodule. So the composition, whether it is solid, cystic, mixed, ecogenicity, whether it is anechoic, hyperechoic, isoechoic, hypoechoic. So um, uh, a hyperechoic nodule uh, will usually be seen in multiple hyperechoic nodules can be seen in a thyrotoxic patient. Uh, a cystic nodule will be completely um, anechoic. So uh, shape, wider, uh, taller than wide is what we are looking at. Wider than tall is usually benign. Taller than wide in case of lymph nodes also becomes very suspicious. Margins, ill-defined, irregular margins become, uh, like, you say, uh, like you see here, the, the points start increasing when it becomes more and more irregular. So that uh, increases your thyroid's grading. Eco presence of ecogenic foci like Microcalcifications. Macrocalcifications do not have a lot of significance, but punctate ecogenic foci or peripheral calcifications carry a lot of significance in case of a thyroid nodule. So this gives us the grading. So uh, as a standard rule, more than one centimeters, usually we advise FNAC for the patient, but based on the suspicion levels, uh, like you can see here, mildly suspicious nodules need an FNAC only more than 2.5 centimeters, moderately suspicious more than 1.5 centimeters, and highly suspicious nodules is when you do an FNAC more than 1 centimeter. But for clinical practice, most often more than 1 centimeter nodules require an FNAC to be done because our patients are not usually very, very compliant. So uh, next is the FNAC. So first, thyroid function test followed by ultrasound neck followed by FNAC. It's the triple test like we do in the breast we do in the thyroid as well. So FNAC uh, is the gold standard for uh, diagnosis of thyroid cancers. Um, again, it, 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 like you can see, the sensitivity ranges only from 65 to 98%. Specificity, specificity is almost 100%. But um, you might not have uh, identified that particular focus and guided your needle into that. So you can still miss a thyroid malignancy in your FNAC. But if you find the focus of malignancy, most often it is malignant. Fairly accurate, except in cases of follicular carcinoma. Like I said, you need gross capsular vascular invasion to diagnose follicular carcinoma as opposed to adenomas. Recently, we have uh, additional molecular markers that we do. Uh, these are specifically done for those uh, which are graded as um, Bethesda 3 lesion. So FNACs, like I said, tyroids is a standard form of reporting for ultrasound neck, whereas Bethesda system is a standard form of reporting for any fine needle aspiration cytology smear. So, um, uh, Bethesda 1 to 6 is what we uh, mentioned. So, Bethesda 3 and above are, is what we are concerned at. Bethesda 1 is a diagnosed, uh, undiagnosed, and uh, Bethesda 2 is benign. Bethesda 3 is AUS or FLUS, that is atypical um, lesion of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. I'll talk about it later. So, these, uh, uh, this Bethesda 3 is, uh, is what requires more uh, testing in the form of molecular markers. We have uh, recent molecular markers in the form of P53, P10, uh, RET, RET PTC, etc. So uh, these identify malignancies. The chance of malignancy in these nodules becomes higher when these mutations test positive. So that is when we decide whether these lesions require surgery or not. Uh, we are talking about molecular markers in very developed nations. In a developing country like ours, where the affordability is grossly low, 
uh, we don't really advise molecular markers. We generally advise follow-up versus surgery in case of Bethes death three lesions. So uh, molecular markers mainly help us in deciding whether these Bethes death three lesions require surgery or not. So next comes serum calcitonin. This is for moderately differentiated tumors, like I said, which is medullary thyroid cancers. Serum calcitonin becomes a very important marker in those patients. Uh, these are polypeptides which are secreted by C cells of the thyroid, parafollicular C cells. They are next to the follicular cells of the thyroid. And the measurement becomes very sensitive and uh, it is usually consistent. And the degree of elevation will indicate the aggressive nature of medullary thyroid cancers. As small as 1 mm also can secrete calcitonin. And uh, there are a lot of conditions where hypercalcitoninemia is seen. So you need to differentiate it from generalized causes of hypercalcitoninemia versus medullary thyroid cancers. And an elevated serum calcitonin can also be detected on the FNAC smears of MTC. And uh, an elevated serum calcitonin in the presence of thyroid uh, nodule will suggest, uh, will suggest medullary thyroid cancers. While a negative test makes a diagnosis of MTC highly unlikely. And they usually use for prognosis. These are markers which are used in the follow-up of medullary thyroid cancers after completion of treatment. So the rising titers of hypercalcitonin um, will tell us that the cancer may have recurred in that patient. So serum thyroglobulin is uh, a marker on the other side for differentiated thyroid cancers. So it's a reliable marker for persistent recurrent metastatic disease. Low preoperative pre -operative thyro, thyroglobulin uh, levels are very controversial. Um, uh, uh, low preoperative thyroglobulin levels, whereas increased um, CEA levels, CEA is carcinoembryonic antigen. These indicate a very poor prognosis. These uh, indicate de-differentiation from differentiated thyroid cancer. So more towards anaplastic cancers. So uh, thyroglobulin levels, again, are used as the follow-up markers in cases of uh, differentiated thyroid cancers who have completed treatment on follow-up. When they come back to us, we see the thyroglobulin levels uh, in them to identify recurrences versus metastasis. Uh, after near total or total thyroidectomy, thyroglobulin, thyroglobulin is secreted by the thyroid follicular cells. So when you remove whole of the thyroid, there is no thyroid for you to secrete the thyroglobulin. So it should ideally fall to negligible levels, less than one nanogram per ml after your total thyroidectomy. So uh, you give it about two weeks because the uh, half-life of the thyroglobulin is about that much so uh, it, it has to fall after the end at the end of two to three weeks to almost negligible levels um, next comes the isotope imaging isotope imaging is not used as a routine procedure for any solitary thyroid nodule unless it is toxic nodule so classically toxicity is detected in uh, your biochemical test which is thyroid function test in that case, you go, go ahead and do an isotope imaging. Otherwise, routinely isotope imaging is not done. And which isotope imaging we do? It is the iodine imaging, radioactive iodine imaging that we do most often for thyroid. So iodine-123, 131 are the most common isoforms. 123 is not available in India. So we, we use uh, 131 for both diagnostical as well as therapeutic scans. Therapy is used either for malignancies or for uh, those patients with thyrotoxicosis as a definitive form of treatment. Uh, FDG. So all these are other uh, um, isotopes that we use for different forms of imaging, not commonly used in the thyroid. There are certain specific indications for each of these, but FDG, FDG is uh, commonly used in the PET scan, the classically used in the PET scan, which is fluorodeoxyglucose. Um, so basically the cells, uh, the malignant cells are told to be rich in mitochondria. So they use up most of the glucose. So they tend to take up the glucose, which is the isotope tagged with uh, uh, this thing, fluorodeoxyglucose in uh, PET scan. So they are they light up in the PET as lighted areas. Uh, they identify METs most commonly. And these are not commonly used in thyroid malignancies. The only indication for doing a PET scan in thyroid malignancy is something called a tennis syndrome. So I'll talk about it, uh, which is radioactive iodine negative thyroglobulin elevation. So those that are not seen in radioactive iodine, those that are not, that, that are not sensitive to radioactive iodine will be, will be more de-differentiated tumors, more towards anaplastic thyroid cancers can be detected with fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. So 80 to 85% of all thyroid nodules are hypofunctional but only 10 to 15% are hyperfunctional. Sorry, uh, it, it needs to be hyper there. Um, so like I said, 
um, malignancy is more common with hypothyroidism rather than thyrotoxicosis. Important modality to detect cancer recurrence. Like I said, in the follow-up uh, of the patient of thy uh, thyroid cancer, for the remnant in the, in the neck or anywhere, metastasis anywhere in the body, we do an isotope scan to uh, detect remnant or recurrence. Metastasis in the post operative period, like, like I said, uh, any form of METs will be detected with the radioactive isotope scan. And any remnant that is left over behind in the neck will be dealt with radioactive iodine. I would like to insist here that uh, no, um, no uh, other form of treatment like radioactive iodine or radiation can compensate for a good surgery. So your surgery needs to be near accurate. Surgery needs to be completely clear. So you cannot say that I will leave behind lymph nodes and radioactive iodine will take care of it. No. Radioactive iodine um, will work only if all of the thyroid, all of the uh, neck um, tissue which is uh, uh, affected by thyroid malignancy is removed. Uh, only then the metastasis will take it take up uh, the radioactive iodine. Otherwise, most of it will be concentrated in the neck and it will give you, give you completely false values. So. Um, uh, before you do a radioactive iodine imaging, you need to uh, do a TSH withdrawal. So these are TSH dependent tumors, right? So um, you need to completely stop the thyroxine so that the TSH elevates. And when the TSH elevates, uh, anywhere in the body, wherever the thyroid tissue is um, remaining, will be taken up, uh, will be taking up the ra uh, radioactive iodine, and it lights up in the scan. So um, you either stop the thyroxine. Uh, post-operatively for about three weeks for the TSH to elevate more than 30, or you give something called the recombinant TSH for a faster elevation of TSH, followed by your radioactive uh, isotope imaging. X-ray neck. X-ray neck is the most basic investigation that we do uh, before surgery, also to find out if there is any invasion. So uh, a long-standing goiter, a long-standing large nodule or a la large multinodular goiter can compress the trachea. So there is a displacement of the trachea or compression of the trachea that can be identified. Calcification also can be identified sometimes in the X-ray neck. And dense calcified nodules in medullary thyroid cancers can also be seen on X-ray neck. Uh, otherwise, most often X-ray neck is done as a pre-operative investigation for the sake of better anesthesia, better surgical protocols. So CT MRI, uh, advanced form of imaging, uh, usually as a standard form of recommendation by ATA. ATA recommendation is what we follow for all thyroid malignancies. Um, so as a standard form of uh, recommendation, most thyroid malignancies which are accepting the microcarcinomas require a CT as a basic investigation. So they, uh, like, I, like I've mentioned here, they uh, give a better identification of the central and the lateral compartment, uh, lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes are better seen with CT scan. So a CT is usually done. Um, CT or an MRI, MRI in very rare cases. Extra thyroid tumor extension can be seen. Invasion can be seen to the local structures. Destruction or infiltration uh, of the surrounding structures can also be seen. So destruction of the trachea, uh, can give us an inkling that uh, trachea may be damaged uh, when you're removing the thyroid and a reconstruction of the trachea can be planned. Retrosternal extension. Sometimes uh, ultrasound cannot give you a picture because um, the, though that uh, part of the tumor which is behind the clavicle cannot be seen within, with an ultrasound. Of course, the clinical examination will guide you towards retrosternal extension, but it is confirmed as to the extent of the retrosternal extension is confirmed, confirmed with a CT scan. It can also tell you the lymph node uh, uh, compartments that are involved and uh, local and distant metastatic deposits can also be seen. CT has an advantage of wide availability and lower cost as compared to the MRI. So the genetic markers, like I said, there are a few gen genetic markers that we do, RET, PTC, RAS mutations, P53 mutations and MRI, mRNA. This is specifically done for those patients which are graded as Bethesda 3 on FNAC. Uh, so they are undetermined. You don't know whether they are completely malignant or not. So you do these markers. If the mutations come positive, then they indicate malignancy. So you go ahead and plan a complete total thyroidectomy. Otherwise, you keep the patients on follow-up and um, uh, uh, bring them back later on to find out if any new malignancy arises in that nodule. So uh, this is the basic pathology that happens. This is why we do the genetic markers that we do for Bethesda 3. So a follicular cell... Uh, Towards when it goes towards a toxic adenoma, it usually has GF uh, G alpha S mutations. Uh, when it has RAS mutations, it turns into a follicular adenoma. 
when it has PPA or gamma pax 8 mutations, it becomes a follicular carcinoma. P53, which is a negative mutation, converts it into D-differentiated tumors like endoplastic tumors. So a red PTC or a RAS or a BRAF mutations, the BRAF mutation usually is considered good mutation. They behave well and uh, they usually result in papillary thyroid cancer. So that is why we do these markers to identify malignancies in the cases of a solitary thyroid nodule. So these are some familial syndromes which are associated with thyroid cancers. Uh, Gardner syndrome, Carney's complex, Cowden's disease are most common. Uh, these are the differentiated thyroid cancers to, to be specific. So uh, medullary thyroid cancers, like you know, are usually hereditary. So it is part of something called the MEN syndrome, multiple endocrineoplasia syndrome. But PTCs, that is uh, papillary thyroid and follicular thyroid cancers are also seen with these syndromes. So uh, a keen eye will look for other tumors like fibromas, desmoid tumors, other upper GI tumors. Uh, Scleroderma-like changes, certain cafeole spots, um, presence of Cushing syndrome, etc., to identify other endocrine tumors in these uh, familial syndromes. So uh, this is the flowchart of management of a thyroid nodule. A thyroid nodule, uh, firstly you do a TFT to identify that the patient is euthyroid. Then you do an ultrasound, after which you do an FNA. So if a FNA comes benign, you identify where the symptom, local symptoms are present. If local symptoms like compression, uh, cosmesis, or uh, 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 a pres a presence of uh, lymph nodes with, a pre with, with uh, an existing thyroid nodule, all of these become local systems. So in that case, you consider surgery. Otherwise, uh, for a benign lesion, you consider follow-up. Follow-up in the form of three or six monthly ultrasound. Uh, why do we do an ultrasound for a benign lesion? Because a de novo uh, beginning of a focus of malignancy can happen in any benign lesion. That is the reason we keep them keep these patients on follow-up. So those that are suspicious on FNAC, like uh, minimally suspicious, moderately suspicious, or highly suspicious, those require surgery. And uh, very few, especially the follicular cancers, uh, with an experienced hand, you can identify the presence of uh, angio invasion in on frozen section requiring a complete total thyroidectomy. So a proven case of cancer, which is Bethesda 6, will require thyroid surgery. So uh, the primary treatment uh, in papillary thyroid cancer, cancers, uh, it differs based on whether they are micro cancers or uh, macro cancers. So micro cancers are those that, is, that are defined less than one centimeter without the invasion of the basement membrane. Uh, they will not be angio-invasive. They will not be locally invasive also. But occasionally, these microcarcinomas uh, can also have metastasis. Uh, death rate is hardly anything, as you can see, and recurrence rate is also very minimal. So they can usually be treated like a benign condition. You can even do a lobectomy for these patients if there is a single focus on one lobe. So like I said, unilateral lo lo total lobectomy or a hemithyroidectomy, lobectomy is the wrong term here. Hemithyroidectomy is what we standard, uh, is the standard recommendation for uh, microcarcinomas by ATA in the present time and age. So total thyroidectomy is a preferred, pay, uh, preferred operation for all high-risk papillary thyroid cancers. So high-risk um, risk stratification is something called the dynamic risk stratification today according to ATA. So the risk is stratified in the beginning, preoperatively, interoperatively, based on the findings that you see on table, you strat stratify them again. And postoperatively, based on your thyroglobulin levels and histopathology report, you classify them as low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk again. So all the high risk, most of the intermediate risk go into uh, total thyroidectomy. Opinions differ on low risk thyroid cancers. Low risk thyroid cancers, can have hemithyroidectomy as an option as well because they have an excellent prognosis. As long as the patient is compliant, you can very comfortably do a hemithyroidectomy in them. Why advocating hemithyroidectomy to avoid hypoparathyroidism? Recurrent laryngeal in nerve injury is almost non-existent because patient, the surgeons are very wary of injuring the nerve. They are very careful around the nerve. But parathyroids are what um, what is what ends up getting damaged during a thyroid surgery and hypocalcemia for a, for, li for a lifetime is extremely debilitating. So to avoid these complications, we try and uh, uh, advise the minimally invasive approach, which is the hemithyroidectomy, because you are leaving behind the other two parathyroids on the other side. Uh, arguments in favor of total thyroidectomy, this is the conventional way. Uh, papillary thyroid cancers were told to be multifocal. Today, they are not 
necessarily multifocal, facilitates post-operative use of radioactive iodine ablation. Uh, today, iodine ablation is possible even with the existing lobe and uh, increases TG sensitivity. Like I said, TG falls below negligible levels only when whole of the thyroid is removed. When you have left behind half of the thyroid, it will still secrete thyroglobulin. But we have a cutoff level beyond which we try and suspect recurrence in those cases. So again, this is an accepted modal, uh, hemithyroidectomy is still an accepted modality of treatment for a single focus of malignancy. Easy follow-up in developing countries. Uh, most of our patients are non-compliant. They usually don't come back once the surgery is done. So they come back with recurrences years later. So uh, safest form of surgery will be total thyroidectomy, especially in high-risk cases. All enlarged lymph nodes in the central and lateral compartments need to be dealt with. Most of these can be identified on imaging. So when we see the image, uh, the most suspicious nodes, the whole compartment needs to be dealt with. No berry picking needs to be um, done. Uh, there is, it's a strict no-no for berry picking. Uh, single nodes, removing single nodes will leave behind focus there and redo surgery in that area becomes extremely impossible. In the central uh, neck, removal is essential, again, because redo surgery becomes extremely difficult. You cannot go back around the nerve and dissect out central lymph nodes again. So your first surgery needs to be the most accurate. Prophylactic lateral neck dissection is not recommended in any cases of differentiated thyroid cancer. Prophylactic lateral neck dissection has, to, has been spoken about only for medullary thyroid cancers, not for differentiated cancers. Only if you find lateral compartment neck nodes involved, only then you deal with them. A functional uh, neck dissection is what we do in the thyroid. So do we divide the neck nodes into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 7. So uh, we don't deal with um, level uh, uh, 7 here because they are mediastinal nodes. And uh, again, level 2 and 5 are divided into 2A, 2B, and 5A, and 5B. So the lateral side, which is 2B and 5A, we usually leave behind in case of thyroid malignancies. 5 is usually not affected. 2, 3, 4, and 6 need to be cleared in thyroid mal malignancies. That is, and that is what is called functional neck dissection because uh, in, including level 5 has a high morbidity of injuring spinal axillary nerve. Shoulder mobility is significantly affected. So that is why 2, 3, 4, and 6 need to be mandatorily removed. If there are significantly enlarged lymph nodes in the compartment 4, uh, level 4, then level 5 also needs to be cleared. So... Uh, this is the Bethesda 3 or 4 that I was talking about, indeterminate or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Um, about 80% of them are benign. Only 20% of them end up being malignant. That is why we do the genetic markers to identify which of these are malignant so that we can offer surgery to those patients. Hemithyroidectomy for follicular lesions. Usually, um, we tell them that uh, there is a possibility of having a second surgery if the hemithyroidectomy, uh, hemithyroidectomy spe specimen is identified as malignancy. Uh, when the lesion is benign, you don't need to do anything further. Hemithyroidectomy, you stop at that. And uh, subsequently, you subject them to radioactive iodine scan uh, to find out if there is any remnant or if there is any metastatic lesion. Uh, ipsilateral lymph node metastatic lesions occur in only about 10% of follicular thyroid cancers. Lateral neck nodes are more common in case of papillary thyroid cancers as opposed to follicular thyroid and uh, about 25% of fertile cell cancers. Uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the central neck need, need to be also removed and uh, follicular thyroid cancers usually have bone mets. They have either sternal mets or scalp mets, etc. So individualized mets can also be uh, offered surgery as a form of treatment. Uh, functional lateral neck dissection is what we recommend for clinically palpable nodes. So this was uh, the ancient form of staging uh, to identify the risk factors. So Amy's, AG's, Macy's, you would have heard that, which includes age, stage, local invasion, etc. based on the stage. So uh, initially, the ATA had recommended the stage is less than 45 and more than 45. Less than 45 were considered only two stages, stage one and two. Metastatic is stage two and rest ev everything else comes in stage one. Uh, whereas stage more than 45 will have stage one, two, classical one, two, three, four. Uh, now, the age cutoff has been increased from 45 to 55 years, so less than 55. Significant number of pa patients are pushed into low-risk thyroid cancers, as you can see, so that a minimally invasive approach can be dealt with most of the thyroid cancers. So this is the variation in the present ATA, um, AJCC classification. The age range is less than and more than 55 years, as opposed to 45 years earlier. So this is uh, the risk factors, the classification of the risk factors based on... Uh, uh, age, grade of tumor, extent, size in various combinations. 
today we don't follow this we follow something called the dynamic risk risk stratification they usually have the same features but they're grouped into low risk intermediate risk and high risk so lymph node metastasis at the time of initial examination do not increase the risk of death in case of papillary thyroid cancers they only increase the risk of local and regional recurrence and uh, in a case of medullary thyroid cancer they indicate a high risk of recurrence in the uh, later stages and uh, several rare type of thyroid uh, malignancies some rare hist uh, histopathological variants like i said tall cell variant columnar variant diffuse sclerosing variant uh, especially these variants were seen in the chernobyl disaster solid variant was what was seen in the chernobyl disaster so they end up being extremely uh, malignant and virulent and aggressive so they need to be dealt with very differently as com they come under the high risk category of um, thyroid malignancy so which require for sure require radioactive uh, iodine therapy later on after surgery. So DNA uh, aneuploid, aneuploidy is very rarely employed in uh, thyroid malignancies. Classically has in uh, tendency of increased mortality in oxyphilic types of uh, follicular thyroid cancers. Adjuvant treatment and close follow-up uh, can then be targeted to high-risk patients if DN DNA aneuploidy is done. And less interventional, uh, less interventional approach. So minimally invasive approach for those which test negative for DNA and uploidy. Uh, adjuvant therapy in thyroid, unlike other malignancies, does not have chemotherapy, does not have radiation. Usually has, most often has suppressive dose of thyroxine um, so that there is no recurrence and radioactive iodine therapy. Only two things. So thyroid, uh, most of these are TSH dependent tumors, <coughs> differentiated thyroid cancers. So they require a supraphysiologic dose. So uh, generally, after a total thyroidectomy, we give 1.5 mcg per kg thyroxine for a patient. But in case of uh, malignancy, we give up to 3 mcg per kg of thyroxine. So it's a higher level of thyroxine that we give so that the all the TSH dependent areas are completely suppressed. So uh, long-term levothyroxine suppressive therapy have a lot of aggressive effects. Most common effects are on the bone and the heart. So uh, osteoporosis is one of the most common side effects of hypothyroidism or uh, supraphysiological doses of levothyroxine as well. So you always usually give calcium and as a, an additional supplement to levothyroxine. So the TSH suppression also varies depending on the risk. Like I said, low risk, intermediate and high risk. Low risk patients have uh, TSH to be maintained between these levels, whereas a high risk patient should have a TSH less than 0.1 milli international units per liter. So uh, remnant ablation is the second form of adjuvant treatment, radioactive iodine uh, remnant ablation. So that disease which is left behind in the neck is dealt with radioactive iodine. Uh, initially, the standard form of treat um, treatment is that uh, a diagnostic scan is done and uh, the area is identified and then the dose is calculated using dosimetry and that particular dose is given for therapy. So destruction of residual microscopically normal thyroid tissue after surgical thyroidectomy, it's an adjunct to the surgical treatment. Three potential advantages, it destroys microscopic cancer cells, subsequent detection of persistent or recurrent disease with a follow-up radioactive iodine scan becomes easy. After radioactive uh, remnant ablation, thyroglobulin levels are measured and uh, serial titers and a six-monthly elevation um, uh, usually suggests recurrence. So like I said, uh, low-risk patients, the uh, usage of radioactive remnant ablation is still controversial. A lot of patients usually end up stopping at surgery in case of low-risk thyroid cancers. And uh, long-term follow-up, like I said, uh, uh, when the patient comes back, uh, we do three things. We do a clinical examination of the patient. We do an ultrasound neck. We do thyroglobulin levels to identify recurrence in the patient. So thyroglobulin levels become uh, highly specific tumor markers for differentiated thyroid cancers. Their levels should be less than one, ideally after surgery. Uh, so, um, increasing titer can give us an idea of recurrence of the tumor. When TSH level is high, after either levothyroxine withdrawal, the recombinant TSH administration. So, like I said, uh, it's a, it's called a stimulated or unstimulated thyroglobulin level. So, a stimulated thyroglobulin level is when we withdraw thyroxine for two weeks and then estimate the thyroglobulin levels. Uh, Long-term follow-up, again, requires a diagnostic scan, a diagnostic scan in the form of radioactive iodine or an ultrasound neck. So in a high-risk patient, usually a diagnostic scan, radioactive iodine scan is performed. Um, again, the thy thyroxine needs to be stopped for three to four weeks before we perform a diagnostic scan. And a diagnostic scan is a low-dose scan. As you can see, the dose is up to 5 millicurie. 
uh, whereas ablative doses are up to 30 to 150 millicuries depending on the remnant disease whether it is in the neck or whether it is metastatic etc so most of the most often it is not empirical dose anymore it is calculated using a dosimetry and uh, post treatment scan is usually done to see that your ablation is complete and all the disease is tackled uh, problems with radioactive iodine scan are it, it has unpleasant symptoms of hypothyroidism poor patient compliance because of a lot of side effects Severe pulmonary or cardiovascular disease, intracranial meds do not respond to radioactive iodine. So the blood-brain barrier uh, does not allow the radioactive iodine to pass through. So radioactive iodine cannot deal with intracranial meds. Brain meds need to be dealt with separately. And uh, recombinant thyrotropin, uh, these are specially used in those patients who require an emergency radioactive iodine scan. So those patients of uh, intracranial meds who have raised intracranial pressure, you cannot withdraw TSH for three weeks in them. So a significant hypothyroidism will add to the raised intracranial pressure. Uh, so in such high-risk patients or those patients uh, who want to travel abroad, who want the radioactive iodine scan, who don't want to wait for three weeks till the TSH uh, rises above 30. So in those patients, we give recombinant thyrotropin. They have a longer half-life. Um, it is safe and effective means of stimulating iodine-131 uptake. Um, also, no symptoms of hypothyroidism in this patient as opposed to TSH withdrawal for a long time. Uh, additional imaging studies, like I said, something called the tennis syndrome. So, thyroglobulin elevation, negative iodine scan. So, there is increase in thyroglobulin suggesting some form of remnant disease or some form of metastasis, but it is not getting identified on your radioactive iodine scan. Those are when uh, those are the lesions where you um, suspect undifferentiated lesions or dedifferentiation in the form of um, turning into anaplastic can cancers. So those are the lesions where we um, prescribe PET scan for the patient. Pulmonary metastatic lesions. Uh, can be identified with a CT scan, bone mats, usually with a radiographic bone survey or a bone scan, uh, MDP bone scan. And intracranial mats, we require a CT scan. Uh, like I said, the only indications for FDG PET is D-differentiated tumors or tennis, tennis syndrome. Uh, tennis, usually, uh, these are radioactive iodine resistant, right? So uh, you give extra physiological doses, high, large doses of radioactive iodine, empirical doses, and C. And if that doesn't work, there are some re-differentiating agents today, which are under clinical trials. Some of them are FDA approved. Those are the ones we give for these uh, specific class of tennis lesions. Persistent or recurrent disease, um, uh, if, so we need to identify whether it is local recurrence, bulky mediastinal lesions where radioactive iodine is not effective or uh, rib lesions. So like I said, individualized scalp meds or sternal lesions can be dealt with surgery. Local recurrence in the form of lymph nodes, large bulky lymph nodes, you cannot deal with radioactive iodine. You need to do a surgery to remove those nodes. Uh, lymph nodes not large enough to exercise, excise like subcentimetric nodes, 8 mm. Uh, so standard recommendation according to ATA is if there is a lymph node which is more than 8 mm, only then you deal with the surgery. Otherwise, uh, you offer radioactive iodine for those patients uh, or any lymph nodes that are very close to the significant structures like parathyroid or nerve uh, where we cannot um, offer surgery. Surgery could be risky and diffuse lung metastasis. Uh, we can offer radioactive iodine. And uh, uh, the thyroid malignancies uh, are so special that uh, a stage 4 disease, that is when it is um, metastatic to the bone or to the lungs, it is still treatable with radioactive iodine, unlike other malignancies where only palliative form of treatment is advised. Uh, side effects of radioactive iodine, like I said, uh, salivary gland damage. So there is salaritinitis, nausea, vomiting, bone marrow depression, transient reduction in sperm count. So these patients are specifically advised to not um, have children for a minimum period of six months to one year if they've, if they've been sub subjected to radioactive iodine. Uh, externally, radiation, a uh, very specific um, malignancies, anaplastic cancers with local invasion, lymphoma of the thyroid, or uh, post-op patients. So uh, while doing surgery, if you have identified tracheal invasion, which cannot be dealt with uh, for an R0, uh, you, which you cannot offer an R0 resection for, or if there is a lesion very close to the nerve and you have not taken consent uh, uh, to excise the nerve in total, um, such cases you can leave a marker behind and subject them to irradiation, local irradiation. So gross invasion, lymphoma thyroid, anaplastic cancers are 
where external irradiation EBRT is offered to uh, thyroid cancer patients. So management of local recurrence, surgical excision is of primary importance for local regional disease, followed by iodine 131 therapy for the remnant disease, followed by EBRT if um, gross invasion is present. Close su surveillance in the near future. So next is the moderately differentiated cancers. I hope I'm not uh, running out of time. Uh, I have maybe a couple of minutes. No, to no, madam. Time is not a constant. Realistic. Yeah. So medullary thyroid cancers uh, are very different cancers from the differentiated thyroid cancers. These are uh, these arise from the small grew round cells, the new rectodermal cells that we classically call from the parafollicular C cells. 75% of these are still sporadic. Only 25% of them are hereditary. Um, the sporadic ones, uh, the minimal surgery that is performed in a medullary thyroid cancer is a standard total thyroid knee with a central compartment neck dissection. So uh, the first surgery is considered best surgery. Surgical treatment is of utmost importance in medical uh, in medullary thyroid cancers because these are not radioactive iodine sensitive. Uh, anything that is left behind will come back as recurrence. So total thyroidectomy with central compartment neck dissection is a basic treatment for any medullary thyroid cancer, even if the central compartment lymph nodes are not enlarged because you don't go back to the central compartment again. Ipsilateral uh, lateral neck node dissection is done only when there are enlarged lymph nodes. Risk factors for recurrence and death um, is tumor size, preoperative calcitonin levels. Like I said, the calcitonin levels also guide the level of surgery. So uh, there are certain levels of calcitonins where we decide where we, when we will uh, do a central compartment or an ipsilateral a lateral compartment or a bilateral um, lateral compartment neck dissection in case of medullary thyroid cancers. Uh, advanced age, extremes of age, extrathyroidal tumor extension, um, Progression of cervical uh, disease to the mediastinum, extranodal tumor extension, incomplete tumor excision, also paraneoplastic syndromes associated with the uh, secretion of calcitonin. All of this will uh, are the risk factors which decide recurrence or death in these patients. And um, serum calcitonin measure, uh, levels, again, should be measured uh, 4 to 12 weeks later. Uh, they indicate the presence of residual disease. And if it is done later on, it indicates recurrence. For residual local disease, you do a basic imaging in the form of ultrasound neck. For metastatic lesions, which are in the mediastinum or neck, um, we do a CT or an MRI. Uh, most of these are usually sensitive to certain receptors. So uh, we do something called the Dotonox scan, Dotonox scan um, which have dopamine receptors, which are sensitive to these, especially the neurectodermal cells. So uh, a metastatic disease is usually dealt with this particular scan, Dotonac or Dotapet is what we call it. Uh, if there are liver lesions, then we do a laparoscopic liver biopsy. So uh, these are the classical men's syndrome that I've uh, described. The 25% hereditary syndromes are associated with this, type 2A and type 2B. Men 2, multiple endocrine neoplasia, type 2A and type 2B. Type 2B, B for bad. So B is more aggressive. So they are seen at a very young age. They have a, a different phenotype. Uh, I will discuss the uh, mutations later. So they have medullary thyroid cancers, pheochromocytomas, and these other form of lesions. And uh, type 2A uh, has medullary thyroid cancers, most commonly followed by pheochromocytomas, um, parathyroid hyperplasias, and cutaneous like hematolysis. It's very important that we see these cutaneous markers which identify the subtype to us. And uh, familial medullary thyroid uh, cancers is a variant of 2A, which is subclassified based on uh, the family history of medullary thyroid cancers. So germline mutations, erect pro proto-oncogene, which is a tyrosine kinase receptor. Uh, this is a mutation classically described in uh, medullary thyroid cancers. All cases of medullary thyroid cancers need red testing to be done. Uh, genetic testing should begin no later than six years. Uh, so any case of MEN2A or MEN2B, which is suspected based on family history from other families, we need to offer genetic testing before six years of age. So uh, these are the codons that are mentioned. So we have something called the high, uh, 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 high higher and highest level of risk. So the most common codon that is associated uh, uh, with these uh, malignancies is the 634. 634 is um, behaves very well. So they usually associate it with men to A. Men to B, B for bad, like I said, men to B is associated with the 918 mutation. The 918 mutation is considered um, highly aggressive. 
So these are patients who come back with recurrence and these are the infants who require surgery before one year of age. So uh, convincing these parents, uh, the child practically has no lesion. The child only has an identified ret mutation. So you need to convince the parent for the infant for surgery or for, um, uh, you have to do a total thyroidectomy, central compartment dis dissection in an infant. So it's practically very difficult to convince these parents. These are prophylactic surgeries that are offered. So um, these 2B variations, you need to operate as early as possible, less than one year of age. This you can op give an additional five years. So less than five years of age, they need to be offered surgery. So the other codons also, these have a very low uh, level of risk, but the standard form of surgery remains total thyroidectomy and central compartment neck dissection. So uh, how do we follow up these patients? Uh, so this patient would have had only a RET mutation detected. So they don't have an identified tumor, identifiable tumor as yet. They don't have a thyroid tumor. They don't have an adrenal tumor also. So you need to keep monitoring them for these tumors. MTC, uh, the thyroid cancer, you need to deal with as early as possible. Like I said, if the mutation is positive, you offer them prophylactic surgery. Whereas the other two, need to be operated only when detected. So they need to be on follow-up. Annually, you have to do a 24-hour urine metanephrine levels. Parathyroid um, is uh, followed up annually with uh, annual parathormone and calcium levels. So in case these are suspicious or these are elevated, then other forms of imaging will be required in the form of MIBG, CT, or DOTA scans. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So... Um, like I said, surgery as early as uh, one year in case of men to B and uh, less than five years in men to A. Prophylactic total thyroidectomy with central compartment neck dissection. Um, so clinically apparent hereditary MTC are those uh, variants, like I said, the familial variant of men to A, FMTC, is when they have significant family history. So uh, adrenocot, uh, the synchronous MTC and pheochromocytomas. So the patient has both adrenal lesion as well as thyroid lesion. You deal with the adrenal lesion first because that's a functional tumor that can put the patient at risk during surgery. Um, adrenocortical sparing adrenalectomy needs to be done because the patient uh, will be on lifelong steroids otherwise. So the cortex needs to be sa saved. Uh, pheochromocytomas, the medullary tumors. So only the medulla needs to be removed. How do you identify medulla on the um, surgical table? classical color. So you leave behind a remnant yellow tissue behind, which is the cortex. So bilateral adrenalectomy, uh, sometimes they have bilateral pheochromocytoma. So classically, these men syndromes usually have bilaterals. Even uh, VHLs, von lippel lindo syndromes also have bilateral pheochromocytomas. So you leave behind the cortex so that the patient is not dependent on steroids for life. Um, in one session for more limited neck disease and separated in time as a two-stage procedures for more advanced neck disease. So uh, initially you can do a total thyroidectomy with central compartment and as and when the patient has lymph nodes in the lateral compartment, you go ahead and do a lateral neck dissection. Uh, again, the uh, calcitonin levels also can give you an in, um, a guideline as to how you approach the lateral compartment and the central compartment based on the calcitonin levels. So... Uh, Less than 200, more than 200, usually you suspect metastasis in the form of lateral neck node meds. So less than 200, you limit yourself to total thyroidectomy, central compartment dissection. And depending on the presence of lymph nodes on imaging, you do an ipsilateral neck dissection. Whereas more than 200, you always most often offer bilateral neck dissection. And uh, uh, medullary thyroid cancers with hyperparathyroidism, you do a limited parathyroidectomy in one stage. And these parathyroid tumors also uh, are usually parathyroid adenomas. They're not hyperplasias. So you need to uh, remove a focused parathyroid that is involved. Um, medullary thyroid cancers with pheochromocytomas, you do total thyroidectomy with central compartment neck dissection with adrenalectomy. So the adrenalectomy becomes first because that's a functional uh, tumor and that puts the patient into crisis. So hence the adrenal tumor needs to be dealt with first followed by thyroid surgery. So RET analysis, which is positive, uh, we do basal calcitonin levels. If it is increased, then you deal with the thyroid. If it is non-normal, you then follow up the patient according to the risk group. Like I said, the mutation, the 918, or which codon is mutated, depending on that, they fall into different risks. And if the RET analysis is negative, no further follow-up is required. This is the standard recommendation for any case of medullary thyroid cancer. All cases of medullary thyroid cancers need to be offered RET gene mutation testing. 
plastic and anaplastic thyroid cancers they are highly aggressive tumors uh, they are rapidly expansive thyroid masses with hoarseness with dysphagia they usually present to the opd in the form of strider uh, in the form of hoarseness in the form of rapidly increasing mass uh they uh, most often require emergency tracheostomies may be multiple or bilateral short duration of symptoms histologically three predominant features are seen spindle cells are what identify anaplastic thyroids spindle cells giant cells squamoid cells spindle cells are also seen in medullary, medullary thyroid cancers um so a biopsy is required in the thyroid only in two cases anaplastic thyroid cancer to start any form of chemotherapy or uh, to start palliation treatment or in a case of lymphoma thyroid to start chemotherapy so only to guide your chemotherapy biopsy is required otherwise all other cases of thyroid malignancies require an fnac for diagnosis uh, primary resection is very very rarely attempted because these patients survive to the maximum of 6 months to 1 year so only in case of the limited disease if there is an anaplastic thyroid cancer which is limited to the thyroid non invasive only then you offer primary resection primary resection followed by adjuvant chemotherapy so again chemotherapy comes in chemo radiation comes into picture only in d differentiated tumors that is anaplastic thyroid cancers only tracheostomy is if the patient comes in strider here there is an existing thyroid you need to open the thyroid you need to do an isthmusectomy to do a thyroidectomy uh, thyroid tracheostomy is quite tricky in these patients post operative ebrt so because of the aggressive local invasion if there is a limited disease Uh, you remove the thyroid then offer the patient local chemo radiation so um, chemotherapy in the form of doxorubicin cisplatin classical drugs followed by aggressive um, local tumor some of these patients initially might not be amenable to surgery you can give a preoperative radiation followed uh, with chemotherapy followed by surgery later uh, you can even do this for differentiated thyroid cancers those that are that are locally invasive you feel that you cannot give an r0 resection to that patient you offer the patient pre operative therapy in the form of certain uh, agents class, um, specifically certain ret inhibitors that we have uh, if you have ha- heard of sunitinib lenmartinib etc we give that pre operatively shrink the tumor and then operate so then you are able to give complete clearance uh, during surgery so the extent of surgery that we do um, thyroidectomy we know Ex- extends uh, between two sternocleidomastoids it even goes beyond the sternocleidomastoid sometimes uh, the entire thyroid lobe needs to be removed um, and the central compartment classically done is central compartment neck dissection in case of uh, uh, thyroid tumors so the boundaries lateral neck tumors we always know but the central neck tumors is what we need to understand it extends from the hyoid bone to the innominate artery you know it is the brachiocephalic underneath so the brachiocephalic needs to be seen or at least palpated when you are doing the surgery so it extends from the hyoid above to the innominate below laterally it is bound by common carotids on either side ipsilateral common carotid this is the area of dissection this area needs to be cleared all fat um, fascia and lymph nodes in that area need to be cleared in and around the nerve especially uh, most of these central nodes are concentrated around the nerve so that needs to be removed along with the thymus which extends below so the posterior border is the deep layer um, the anterior border becomes a superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia and the posterior border becomes the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia which encloses the carotid so you open the carotid sheath only in case of lateral neck dissection in a central neck dissection your lateral limit is a common carotid artery so yeah that's about it thank you